Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, so if you were here for my first session at 11, I believe, it's the exact same presentation uh, covering restarts, lineouts, and scrums. I just want to thank you guys all for attending this. Like, this is an awesome thing we're doing to grow rugby here in Wisconsin, here in the States. Um, you know, so thank you guys all for taking the step to, to educating yourselves, educating others. This course is mainly, des or this presentation is mainly designed, um, you know, not on the technical part, like how to lift a line out, how to jump in a line out, scrum binds, footing. It's really designed about how you approach it, what your players are thinking, where you are on the field, um, just because in rugby, we can't call timeouts. And one thing I've experienced when I'm in the tech zone is, you know, my players on the field just can't hear me. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, so I can't say, do Rhino, or whatever it is. So what I try to do with my college program is to train my players to take that accountability, to take it upon themselves. We rep this out all throughout the week, and on Saturdays, that's where I enjoy it. That's where I have fun, because all, all of it comes together. Uh, my background, I'm from Wisconsin here, grew up, um, played just outside Waukesha, uh, the city of Waukesha. I played, went to school at AIC um, for five years, and then um, played down for the Austin Huns for a season. Then I went to go back and coach at AIC, and then now I start a brand new program, University of Rio Grande in Southern Ohio. So, this, all these concepts, everything here, I'm giving examples, stuff that's worked for me. Not saying this is what you need to do, what you have to do. A lot of this may seem elementary to some of you guys. A lot of it may seem way advanced. This is just something I've, I've put together that, that's worked for me as a player, worked for me as a coach. Something that's easy to teach, um, and kind of what, after all these years, just comes together. Um, yeah, so, course is mainly designed for 15s forwards. Um, you know, sorry if you're here for back nine moves and stuff, go to the next room. Um, but it's designed for coaches, captains, decision makers on your squad. So timeline here, actually we ran through, the well, first time I did this went through 45 minutes. But I'm gonna cover restarts for about 10 minutes. I want you guys to ask questions, ask me scenarios, like, you know, would that work inside the 22 or whatever it is. Uh, then we'll move on to lineouts, both attacking and defending questions afterwards, and then scrums. Um, if you have any questions or just want to bounce ideas, I'll be in the recruiting row um, at the University of Rye Grand table. All right, so restarts when we're kicking. First things first, like, you just gotta know your personnel. You gotta know your players. Um, you know, I've coached teams that had a strong kicker that just can kick high in 10, put a quarter out on the, on the 10 meter line, they can nail it every time. I've had kickers that just are developing. And so you kind of teach them, all right, do line drive kicks, you know, kick it deep, whatever it is. But what I personally like to do, if we're starting the match kicking, I want to test their kicker. I want to put their backs under stress and just see where they, what they do, if they have a strong kicker. So if you see yourself starting the match kicking off, test their kickers. Um, and the idea of three starts in general, what we well, what we eventually want to work to is I try to set up my squad, set up my lineups, where after that first kick deep, I want to kick it high in 10, get my forwards underneath it and win that ball back for us. So majority of the time we're kicking it deep, testing their kickers, and then the rest of the match we're just putting it high in 10 and trying to win that ball back for us. And then Almost every restart, I want that wing on that side applying pressure. Usually your wings are the fastest players on the field. Uh, I want them um, causing chaos, causing distractions, applying pressure to the receiving squad. So the setup here. So for demonstration purposes, yes, I only have seven blocks for forwards there, but forwards are blue. That's what we're focusing on is forwards, blue blocks. The red are our backline players. And my general philosophy is I don't like split forwards uh, for restarts when we're kicking off. I like to over, overload one side, left or right, because what I do, what works for me in the past, I preach a concept called a forward wall. 
You have all eight forwards coming up together, applying pressure to their receiving forwards. So if we kick it deep, so that red block on the, on the side there near touch, they're your fast player, they're your wing. They're going deep, we're kicking deep as well, and if they work it back to their kicker, trying to clear it out, if it's inside their 22, that kicker is there causing chaos, causing stress on them, forcing them to make a bad kick, or whatever it be. You want to, tra I train my forwards. The reason why I overload forwards on one side is if we split it, forwards usually, I want one even wall pressure. When you split your forwards, they typically, you have gaps. You have one side going farther than the other. The reason why I say all eight forwards on one side overloaded is that they're applying the same line speed and putting pressure on them, uh, making tackles as a unit. But, so your forwards closest to your kicker. Tell them to start fanning out towards your back line because if that opposition that just received it, they work it wide to the right, our, our right side here, and they're running at three back line players there, they need some help. It sucks making open, open field tackles. So those forwards near kicker, Tell them to go straight, but you know, be there for your backline player because you got your kicker staying in the middle here, your fullback. Oh, and also, if you got a wing applying pressure deep, you need your fullback, which is right here. Your fullback here, they're funneling over. So if they do kick it deep, they're there to recover it. This is your weak side wing. They're dropping deeper, deeper than everybody for any sort of opposite field kick. So you got three back line players. Tell your closest forward to the kicker to kind of funnel up and support your back line. So that's kicking deep. And then for a majority of the match, I tell my kickers, if I have a strong kicker that can put it high in 10, I like to kick short, short in 10, and that wing is still applying pressure. But they kind of create a J line, hook line, whatever it be. Because your forward wall are coming up in one unit, one flat wall. You've got your tall locks. You've got players that can jump in the air. I teach that they're trying, those forwards, trying to tap it back. Catch it cleanly if they can. Or make a solid tackle. That wing that's applying pressure and doing that J-line hook, they're causing stress. They're causing chaos. chaos. So if the opposition forwards catches it cleanly, and just passes out to their nine or fullback, whatever it is, that wind is circled around, kind of entering behind all that receiving team. They're there block, they can intercept any pass to a nine, any pass to a 10. So that wind is kind of crucial in all this, where they're kind of blitzing on the outside and causing stress, causing chaos. Um, same thing, um, uh, the fullback drops deep, where places where that wing would be deep, the opposite wing as well. And a good strategy, if your wing just scored an 80 meter try, they're gassed, whatever, you can flip flop your wings every kickoff or whatever, whatever it be. Um, and then nine, if you're going short and 10, I would train my nine to get right behind that forward wall. So if you do win it, your forwards tap it back, whatever it be, nine's right, ready right there to play it out to the back line. So really, if you're kicking it short and 10, I train my nine to get right behind that forward wall. So if there's a tap back, who are they tapping it back to? Your nine, so we can set up our attack. So that's kickoff short and deep. So kick receive. So a lot of times I hear, oh, just do exploded scrum. Who's here ever heard of exploded scrum for restarts? Yeah, that's, that's kind of the base, that's kind of the bread and butter. But I have the, the, the privilege to work with my players um, every day in some way. So what I try to do is make my locks and my loose forwards the primary for receiving the ball. Um, so uh, this right here, this person's at the 10 meter line. And I love crossover athletes because I train that hooker um, so just say the restart is the door right here, right? So the door's right there, the camera right there, that's where the kick is starting. I'm the hooker, I'm at 10 meters. I train them to be like a basketball player in between your man and the ball. So they're, they're putting their back towards the sideline and they're looking 
at their receiving or their teammates and the, and the kick. The point is, anything short, a line drive kick, or whatever it be, they can play it. But the hooker's main job is we want to play in the air. We want to get a lift for our locks, play in the air. So hooker's main responsibility is a front lift. That's why they're facing their teammates, facing the ball. So when that ball goes high in 10, hooker can kind of get in the way, um, legally, and get their hands on the, the thighs of their jumpers and get a nice clean lift. What we do here, so we got two two-person pods. These front pods are your locks. Right behind them are props. They can pre-bind, they can, you know, I want them stacked. Train your props to not go after the ball. Train your props on restarts, this short, high and 10, that they're right behind them supporting their lock to get up in the air. If they have the one-man lift, awesome. If we get a hooker in front of them, we get a two-man lift, even better. Um, so the hooker is right at the 10 meter line. Have these two two-person pods probably another five to 10 meters behind hooker. Because I always want, if you're receiving a ball, I want you running onto it. I don't ever want players retreating. We have players retreating. Sometimes you have communication issues. Ever see two rugby players smack into each other, just miscommunication. We're trying to prevent that. So this is one of the toughest jobs. When I played lock, I played lock. The toughest skill for me to play was receiving a kick return going up in the air, right? One thing, you're tracking the ball, you're coordinating with your lifters, and you're trying to go up while the ball's going down. That was by far the hardest skill as a lock I had had to learn. But train your props to not go after the ball, and, um, and then your loose forwards, you have a flanker on the inside, eight man in the middle, and flanker in your touch. And one good thing I teach all my players on restarts, 15s or 7s, is right, we got the camera there, the door's here, that's where the kickoff is. I tell them to put their outside hand up, right? So outside hand up. If that ball goes over their, their hand, they shouldn't go after it, right? So that's why that flanker near touch, they kind of have the last call after everything. They, if all else fails, that last flanker should be the person receiving that ball for us. But if this lock right here, they will, I never want them retreating. I never want them backing up. It's just a lot of coordination. Um, you know, experienced players are good at it, but you know, this is really designed towards high school and collegiate level players. So if your player's hands go up, we have a call called darkness. So you know, a lot of times players just say over, over. If I'm that lock in that first pod and it goes over my right hand, I just yell darkness. Top of my lungs, darkness, darkness. So my players behind me you know it's their, their responsibility to get that ball back. Um, I also train my tight fives, my hooker, props, and locks, that if, because they're near that 10 meter line, they're the closest to it. And they're strong runners, they've got more power behind them. If a tight fight player receives the ball, I train them to take it into contact. Draw, draw in some defenders, tight five on restarts, always take it into contact. Now, if you're a loose forward, if you're a flanker eight man, you get the ball, just because you're a little bit deeper, I give them the option to either take it into contact or work it out towards the back line. Um, we don't really have a call for that, but if you're a flanker eight man in this setup, if it kick, kicks, gets kicked deep to you and there's no defender within 10 meters, maybe work it out wide. Or if you're a strong runner and you just feel like being selfish, take it up, draw on defenders. Um, so that's what you try to teach. It's type five, when they get it, take it into contact. Break through that game line. Go down the ground, play possession. Um, if you're loose forward, look at what's ahead of you because that kick is deeper, you might have a little bit more time to either play to the back line or take it up yourself. But what we're trying to do is create two pods of four. Your main primary receivers are your, your locks and loose forwards. Now, there is a time, so I don't like splitting my forwards, but a lot of times I see it too where the opposition, the kickoff, 
will split their forwards. So they're in gray here, kicker's in the middle. If this happens, you just gotta trust your players, trust your on-field captains. I don't have a system where props and locks are on one side, hooker and loose forwards on the other. I just say getting two, getting a grid system, sort of be. And every time, just because, um, usually, so, and then when you do this as well, I'm not, I didn't set it up, but your back line will be distributed evenly on both sides as well, in the middle and deep behind the two forward pods. <laughs> but same thing goes, tell them to raise their right hand. If that ball goes over, we're not gonna be able to get a lift, but if that ball goes over, just take it cleanly, put a knee up, protect yourself, get up in the air, um, and win that ball cleanly. If this pod gets it here on the left-hand side, they take it into contact, we have a ball carrier, we have two players clearing, rucking, and one player sealing at the end. So that's kind of what we do for kickoff receive, or uh, kickoff split. Um, let's see. And with this too, so like, if it gets kicked to a forward pod, those four are creating a first phase, first possession, your back line needs to set up quickly because your forwards on that right hand side are way on the other side of the field. So after that first ruck, you need your back line set, making decisions, making moves to get fate onto phase two, phase three. Does anybody have questions on restarts, both kicking, both receiving? Yes. Uh, back to your deep kick. Yeah. Um, so you said, um, drop the fullback, drop the uh, weak side wing, and drop the nine. Wouldn't yes. it make more sense to drop the kicker because he's already back there? To have the, the three rather than the nine? Well, it's, so your kicker could be anybody. Your kicker could be your nine, your 10, right. your fullback. So really what I want in this diagram here, this is my kicker. This is, I would, I would say this is nine, this is fullback, this is the opposite wing. You got your 10, the center's here. So yes, I want this fullback that's inserting in to be deep, to play touch, to receive any sort of kick that doesn't go into touch. Nine, who just kicked for us, nine is hit kind of hanging, because if we kick it deep, we're kind of expecting them to win that ball clean. Our forward wall's applying pressure. Nine is kind of hanging out in the middle for any sort of short, short kick. And then this opposite wing, is really kind of the deepest person. So if that fullback catches that ball, doesn't go into touch, that fullback has a wing. Yes, that's a long pass, but they're, they're a support player um, to, to counter, counter attack it. So if you're, if you're 10, would you, would you kick it, you drop the 10? Yes, right. yeah, just kicker in general. Whoever kicked it, we're not dropping okay. yeah. for any short kick over that forward line. Good question. Any other questions on, and I mean, the new rule added with goal line drops, 22 drops, you know, for me, we had 11 games this fall in 15s, happened twice, that we had to receive, oh, we, didn't, we didn't kick off any uh, goal line drops or anything, we had to receive two of them. So we trained for it, we're on uh, drop 22s or goal line drops, we, we train to, kick it deep, but not have that wing pressure. It's just something we went with, because I would rather, just because we are on our goal line, I want that wing to kind of play deep and help support um, and protect that trial line. You know, I'm still developing that too, the drop goal, like, it's new this year, like, I didn't get a chance to really test it out, so. You know. Any questions on restarts? Yeah. For the last one, where the nine uh, Receiving? Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's all about knowing your personnel, too. Ideally, I would like my nine deeper, because if any of these forward pods get it, and they take it into contact, nine's deep behind all of them, so they can go right, they can go left. Um, up here, I would probably put my centers, because if they get it cleanly, they, centers love to crash through. They love contact. They should. So I would have centers here, nine, ten, Wings behind all of them, and full back insert again wherever we need them. Right. Any other questions? All right, my favorite part about rugby. Lock loves lineups. So, 
what I try to do is keep things simple. When you're making calls, when you're making decisions on who's jumping, where they're jumping, keep it simple. Use terminology. And the best way to do this is create a glossary of some sort, create a playbook like this. Let all your players know kind of where you're jumping, who's jumping, um, and your cadence with it. Um, but at the end of the day, keep things simple with the play calls, where you're going with it. Um, you should rely, and you should do your job as coaches, training skills, training the technical part of it. Because you can get so advanced with moves, with you know, up and fake lifts, whatever it is, fake jumps. But at the end of the day, you win more lineouts on whoever you can get up the hot, get up the farthest up in the air. So that's one thing I preach is guys don't get you know. All right, it's cool to have all these sneak plays, these trick plays off of lineouts, but at the end of the day, you still got to get somebody up in the air. You still got to grab that ball and maintain possession. And I think at any level, you should have three variations of attacking lineouts. And I like full man lineouts, seven in the line. Five man and four man. Why? Because you're gonna have injuries. You're gonna have yellow cards. You're gonna have, you know, strong jumpers or not strong jumpers. I like to have three different types of lineouts because if those things happen, you need a contingency plan. And what I did starting a brand new program this fall is we started with a seven man lineout for two weeks. We had training camp and then two weeks of just full lineouts. Once we mastered that, we moved on to five-man lineups. Once we mastered that, two weeks later, we went to four-man lineups. The point is, when you're getting a new group together, you're teaching them scrums, lineouts, set pieces, moves, whatever it is, to throw in all these lineout calls in a couple of weeks and just go play a game with all this, you know, chaos. I I just haven't seen my players pick it up in two weeks. So. And if teams are scouting you, if you play your first game and all you do is full lineouts, they're going to say, all right, all Ryo does is full man lineouts. That's what we're going to prepare for. But the next week, all right, if they're prepared for that, now we got a five man lineout. Now they just you know, have no idea what we're doing. Then we throw in a four man lineout. So that's how I progressed our lineouts, our attack and set pieces on, is kind of introducing new lineouts every two weeks. Um, so this is, so bear with me for a minute, this is kind of how I train my players to take the strategic approach to things. So I don't want my lineout callers to be a quarterback at the line. I don't want them sitting there going green 18, you know, blue 15, set, go. Because I, me as a defensive jumper, things get predictable. If you hear, if the other team has a call for a wall or call off the top, you know, you can pick up on those keywords quite easily. Experienced players know how to do that. So what I like to do is have a pre-call. So the ball goes into touch, have your eight forwards and your scrum half kind of just slowly walk together, make your pre-call, who's jumping and where they're jumping. So they're, and then once your thrower goes into touch, it's ready to go. Um, so the, so um, once your hooker or your thrower gets set, I want your hooker, or I want my thrower to be set. And they're prepared, ready to go, throw in where we're jumping. The movement, how we move, where the jumpers go, and where we lift, is off who's jumping, okay? So bear with me for a minute. Um, so we have calls for off the top, down and pop, down and maul, uh, thrower inserting in, and a check call. And I like using terminology that's easy to pick up. So if we, these letters here, O, anything that starts with O, orange, Oklahoma, you know, it's simple, nothing else starts with O. So if your players hear <coughs> Oklahoma, that means we're going off the top to our scrum half and we're playing on. If they hear anything D and P, that means we're going to take it down and pop to our scrum half. So dragon purple, dragon purple. All right, D down, P, pop pass, dragon purple. D and M, dragon monsoon, dragon monsoon, down, and then set up in the mall. Insert, anything with an I, igloo, um, Idaho, whatever it is, the hooker's coming in, or the thrower's coming in, 
and inserting uh, play on the ball. And then check, if you're jumping at the back, check just, you do a check call as you're walking in, you see the defense is all lined up, ready to contest at that spot. Check if it's you're at the farthest jumping pod, you just move it one spot forward. If you're jumping at the front and you see the defense is set up there, you just check just means you move it at one pod back. All right, so that's just the guts of it. So here's some demonstrations. All right, so purple, we're attacking up, north, up there. All right, so up top, we got a full line out. In the middle, we got a five-man line out. On the bottom, we have a four-man line out. That's what I've been working with for the past couple years. L is your lifter, J is your jumper. Um, okay, so in your full man lineup, I want my front lifter heels on the five meter line and my back lifter at the 15 meter. The rest of these five players, they're walking into the lineup. So what that means is, so your front lifter and your back lifter never moves. They're setting the channel. The rest of those five players in the full man lineup, you know, you play with a sir. I've had sirs this year that lets us walk into the line out and then just go from there. I've had sirs that say, cut it out. You know, we don't want that. So you just have to play the ref. If you can, start early, have your five jump or your five players in the middle there. And for a full man line out, I like three jumpers. So those five players, it's usually one, one, one or two steps in, and then whoever's jumping, as soon as they make that direction to jump, that's when everything goes. And then your, your thrower is ready to go and hits it right at the spot. Five man lineup, same thing. Your front lifter, your back lifter never moves. Those three jumpers in the middle are all jumping options. But just say we lift that person in the middle. Those two jumpers are now lifters. And then at the bottom, we have a four man lineup. Same thing. Now that's a lot of space to cover, the five and 15 meter line. So these lifters are a little bit you know, inside the channel because there's a lot of ground to cover with four people. All right, so that's the setup. Now we're gonna go into more technical things. So this is a full man lineup with the, the insert call. Insert is your thrower coming in. So with a full man lineup, you get your cadence, you know where you're, who's jumping, what pocket you're jumping at. So just say we jump and lift at B here. So that lifter goes here, that lifter's there. On the movement, we get a nice high lift. Your thrower is coming in, and, and you can do insert Oklahoma igloo. Oklahoma igloo off the top and to our inserting thrower. That's just a small move. You know, don't rely on that too much. That's once, one or twice, once or twice in a game. Um, also, red blocks is our back line. I always like having my scrum half closest to the five meter line. Why? If they're somewhere in the middle here and we lift in the front at A, well now scrummy needs to move the back track and then play it out to our first receivers. So I always teach my nines to start close to the five meter line. If we lift at C, all they have to do is move this way. If we lift at B, they move. If they start in the middle here and we go to A, they have to backtrack and even a longer pass the first receiver. All right, five man line out. If you've got five players, your thrower, same thing, your nine, same thing. I, and five man lineouts are my favorite lineout. I think you have more room to work with, more creativity with your jumpers. And also you have two strong forwards. You know, if you got forwards, a lot, some bigger forwards that, you know, you know, just more utilized playing off of 10, go, go with this. And I always like giving my first receiver an inside option and an outside option. But one thing you gotta train, <clears throat> right? So touches there. Our whole back line is set. If you have a forward here, train them to, uh, to get through, right? So they are an option to receive it and run at the opposite 10. But if you have a forward here, they're in, they're, you don't want them to be in the way. So if you do throw it behind and get it to your back line, 
The last thing you want is this forward causing chaos in the way. So uh, phi half first receiver here has an inside option, outside option. All right, four man attack. This is for groups that have a lot of continuity, experienced players, strong jumpers, strong lifters, players that you know are very experienced with the game. It's pretty much the same thing. Now we have four options, and that's what I'm saying. This is something that you have to work to, something you have to train and rep a lot. Um, you have four areas you can jump. Same thing as a five-man lineup, but all you're doing is inserting another forward out here. Same thing, you have to train this player. They're not just running a dummy line. They're, they're uh, an option as well. But this 10 now has several options. They've got inside, outside, a skip pass to a forward, or back door to their back line. Now, right, so what is a cadence? What is something, you know, who do we know, who's jumping and where they're jumping? So I have the privilege to have jumpers that are from different states. So we, everybody on our team is from different areas of the country. So whoever our three strong jumpers are, we just say, you know, our front jumper is Ohio, because he's from Ohio. Our middle jumper's from Florida, he's Florida and then Texas is our third jumper. We got A, B, C is the areas we're jumping. So if we say, and with the A, B, C, you're using calls like apple, banana, carrot, whatever it is. Or since you're doing a pre-huddle and you're walking in, the defense can't hear you, you could just say jump A, Ohio A. And it doesn't have to be states. Like if you're a high school team and you're all from the same county, you can use nicknames, or you can just straight up use each other's names. You can say, John A, John A. Uh, but here, you know, we're walking up, we're getting our cadence. So just say a full man line out. Our front and back lifters are set. They, they're at the channel, they're at the, at the mark. These five players are one to two steps back, and they say, Florida C, Florida C. So this middle jumper is gonna backtrack and jump at C. And one thing I try to do is if a jumper's ever moving backwards, I don't, so if my thrower's here at this wall, and I'm, I'm floor to C, I'm going backwards, I never teach backtracking. I try doing that as a lock, as a jumper, it's just, the timing's off. So if you're a jumper and you ever find yourself going back, just straight up turn around, run to your spot, and then wait for your front lifter to get there. That way you have a better time on your jump. Um, same thing here. I mean, you're just really minimizing, you know, as we progress. So this is more of the simpler concepts because you have more lifters in place, more jumpers. Here you have fewer lifters, and here you have four players trying to cover a lot of space, a lot of territory. Um, so yeah, I mean, with these calls, this is just an example of what I've used in the past, but you don't have, to just keep it simple, like, no more than three jumpers in any of these systems, so give your three jumpers, just, they can say their names, they can say their nickname, or their favorite food, just something to identify who's jumping. And then pockets, you can even do, instead of ABC, you could do one, two, three, you know, whatever it is. It's just putting a label to where you're jumping. Uh, defensively, you know, we always, always match numbers, and, oh, well, going back to attack. So I would always put my strongest jumper in the middle. My second strongest jumper near the back, and then my third strongest jumper up front. Why? Because a lot of teams, uh, what I'm gonna say as well is, they always contest in the front. They want you to throw high, they want you to throw over. They're trying to make you to throw overthrow everything. So, you know, I see a lot of teams that have a really good jumper, but they always put them at the front. Try working them in the middle, working them in the back. Train your thrower to make those thrower passes. Yes, it has to be a little bit higher, but most time that I see it, and I mean, what we do as well is we go after them. We say, we always lift a pot up in the front, two-man lift, because we want them to throw high. We want to create those overthrows. So 
you know, matching numbers, they have a really experienced team. So, or newer teams, that front jumper, have them pre-bound, pre-set, looking at their thrower. Always, you know, always lift in the front. But as you have more experienced players, your team comes together, you guys are doing really well, the rest of those jumpers and lifters near the back, have them face the opposition. Have them looking at their feet. Never look at their thrower. Have them look at the feet of who's jumping, who's lifting. So have them face, and what I teach as well, so if it's a full man lineup, oh, you always have a two man lift and a jumper in the front. You got four players in the back, designate one person to jump, two lifters, and one overthrow. That jumper that's in the back, have them moving a little bit. Have them pacing back and forth in that line, causing chaos, because if, if that jumper, our jumper in the back, is set, ready to jump, that makes it easy for the attack to say, all right, we're gonna check, or we're gonna go here, we're gonna go there. But if you got your jumper just pacing like this, they don't know where you're contesting in the back. So just kind of create as much chaos as you can defensively. All right, so that's attacking defensive lineups. Does anybody have any questions or any scenarios you want to run through? Yeah. So for your five and four lineups, are you having your lifters run to the jumper? Or no. are you having jumpers that can also lift? So five and four? Yeah. Yep. So this, these back lifters mm -hmm. and these front lifters never move. Okay. Yep. I mean, that's, they, I mean, what I teach is they never move. But, so that puts a lot of pressure and a lot of coordination with your jumpers. So if we go C, you know, whoever's jumping, if it's Ohio, Florida, Texas, whatever it is, they know that, you know, I need to go back here why? But also, too, so my thrower can see where those lifters are and they can kind of calibrate how far they need to throw. So if they know this back lifter is never going to move in, they know, all right, that's at 15 meters. That's a good point where I need to aim for. So if it's at C, um, this jumper is moving back, this jumper needs to haul tail and get to be in the front. A lot of ground cover, but that's just, that's why you got to rep these, and that's why. I wouldn't add these two until your team gets this this concept well. Yeah, so then for that, you need jumpers that can also lift. Yes. Yeah. Because you still want options. I mean, yeah. I mean, I like having a few jumpers, but you can you can switch it up too. With the five man here, you can just make this a primary lifter, a, a back or front lifter too. That's why you just got to know your team. I mean, this is just an example that I worked with in the past. I like having three jumpers and a two for four man. But um, yeah, I mean, once you master something like this, these two things can be applied easily. Any other questions? All right. And of course, all those calls I mentioned, Oklahoma, um, Dragon Purple, you know, all those things are calls that are gonna be consistent and could work with all these here. I mean, you're not gonna maul four people. I mean, let's be realistic, but um, that's why your, your play callers, your decision makers, just need to rep things through. And as a coach, just say for a full man lineup, we call um, Oklahoma Igloo. That's an off the top insert from the thrower. You're repping it at practice and you don't get it the first time. Don't just say, as a coach, don't just say, do it again. Keep you as a coach, keep using the terminology. Keep using the language that you want your players using. So if you Oklahoma Igloo, Oklahoma Igloo, um, that's off the top insert for the, the thrower, if you keep using that terminology, you keep using that language, your players are gonna remember it. Repetition, they're gonna remember those calls. So that's just something I try to do in training is just reps. And like I said, at the end of the day, you can get all fancy with different moves off the top, different mall moves. But at the end of the day, you win lineups by how high you can get your teammates off. So work, so really work on the technical parts. You know, good lifts, good jumps, two hands catch, and pass to your nine. So attacking scrums. So, so eight man picks, right? So I'm a believer that I really don't like eight man picks. I think, you know, I like having my back line set, 
looking where that open space is, where those weak points are, and attacking it. But there's a time to use them. When you're in scoring position on the five meter line, if your nines and tens are getting constant pressure um, to control the game, to manage time, and if the weather's cracking too, right? If it's muddy, rainy, windy, just can't make those long passes, you do need eight, you do need eight man picks. Um, I prefer to use them in the five and 15 meter channels. I don't like midfield eight man picks because your back line is split and then you just don't have all your options to run off of. There is a time and place for it, but this is just my preference is we do eight man picks near touch in the five and 15 meter channel lines, right? So here's a pitch. Very rarely we do an eight man pick in the middle, but inside the five and 15 meter, that's where we like to work our eight man picks because we have our wings involved with it, um, our fullback inserting in. That's just how I like to keep things basic. Right, so whatever eight man move you go with, go with eight man pick, try to keep it the same on either side. So we got our right, our left side eight man pick. Um, I use calls, like if we're gonna make a right eight man pick, say something that starts with the letter R, Ringo, Rhino, with the left hand side, something with an L, Lucky, Lucy, whatever it is. Um, you know, whoever your captain is, whoever your play caller is, just make sure everybody uh, knows that. So we're working eight-man picks near the five and 15 meter channel line because we're working our wings involved with it. So your eight-man is your decision maker. They're the person leading the attack, exposing the, the or using space, and just creating options for their nine and wing. And you can do so many crazy plays. I mean, this is just some an eight-man move that I know it's consistent, and I know it's just basic and will work. So over here, if you go Rhino, Ringo, whatever it be, your eight man is setting up the play, setting first phase. They're attacking on the edge here. Nine, you hopefully have a smart nine. Nine's got options. So the eight man picks here, nine is really looking ahead on who's coming off the defensive scrum. If it's the opposite flanker, if it's the eight man, nine just needs to have to rep it out and just see what's in front of them. So as eight man picks, nine can insert as an inside option, outside option, and you got your wing as well, kind of as a skip pass. So hopefully you don't have an eight man that's selfish, that just likes to run and just run downhill um, and be selfish. Hopefully your eight man, if they do pick it, you know, they know, yes, I got an attack, but I still gotta look out for my options too. Um, I really don't incorporate flankers much into this, unless we do break a tackle, break the game line, then the flanker can just follow through, be that, that help with that breaking that second phase of defense. So on the other side, you do Lucy, Lucky, whatever it is, a left or an L call, same exact same thing on the other side. So really to have a good eight man pick in something like this, the big pivotal part is make your eight man making a good decision um, if they're gonna take it straight into contact or offload it, and nine making decisions is an inside option or outside option. So something like this, your eight and nine are the two pivotal parts of this. Then it's just your wing being open for a skip pass. I mean, you can get crazy with it too. You can have your fullback insert in as well, but this is what I like to do if we're in the five or 15 meter channel line and just working with our wing um, on that side. So we are going to have do eight man picks in the midfield. So yeah, chaos with a lot of arrows there, but just more options. So pretty much the same thing with your nine and wing. Your eight man's picking. He that that eight man is making a decision. Attacking, they can attack out wide. They can attack right off the scrum. Nine is inserted in or outside based on the flanker or eight man. The only difference here is the flanker. So if we scrum middle and we do an eight man pick, I want this flanker to loop around that eight man. So your nine's crashing through inside or outside. Your, your flanker on that side is your first ruck support. 
your first offload support. Um, really, you're training your nine to kind of read eight, uh, the flanker, because flanker is taking a loop around, kind of being that outside option. So ideally, your nine's inserting in, but your flanker, your nine, is really your first ruck support if that eight man just gets tapped in right away. But since we're in the middle of the field, we have a split back line. Just say we attack right, we go right out, whatever it is. Let's incorporate our centers involved in there too, our crashing centers. So eight man's picking it, and if they are skilled enough, that they have good vision, they get the defense committed inside, their space open outside, you have a center crashing through. Centers love to crash. Eight men, centers love to crash. So if you're in the midfield, try to incorporate your nines, your twelves, and your flankers based off what the eight man does. Um, your first receiver, your fly half, or fullback is just deep enough where they can just be there to help clean up anything, rough support, offload support. If you break that gain line and you're going to second phase defense, your flankers haul and tail to get there, your fly half, you know, it's just the green light after that. Um, yeah, but the big pivotal part here is that play side flanker needs to loop around the eight man. All right. That's pretty much it. Anybody have questions on scrums? Really recovered attacking scrums. Um, what I like to do defensively, so if we got an eight man pick, defensively, I want to force them to pass out, pass wide. I never want my flanker, my eight man to over pursue. It's like a quarterback option in football. Make, the op make your opponents pass. If you make them pass more, there's more room for error, knock-ons, mishandles, whatever it be. So one thing I try, try to train my flanker on that side, my eight man, is to, to stay near the, near the scrum. Um, force them to pass out wide. So a lot of times too, teams will bring in a weak side wing, a fullback inside here as well, and you don't want them running out the middle of the field. So force them to pass out wide. More room for error, they pass out wide to the wing, you have more time to get your back line to trace and tackle. But that's really what we teach on defensive scrums, is make, if they do an eight man pick, make them pass. Force them to pass out wide. All right, so the concept here was really nothing on the technical side, scrum binds, footings, lineouts. It's more just how we approach forwards 15s. How we can get eight forwards together, understand where we're going, where we're attacking. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully next next summit I can talk more about scrum lifts, or uh, line out lifts, scrum binds, all that. But what I try to do is rep every possible lineup, rep every possible sub. Because if you just rep one play caller for lineouts, and he or she is out for a yellow card, or they're injured, whatever it is, and you don't have a confident lineup caller, you need to rep your, your younger players, your less experienced players. Give them the power to make those decisions. Um, whatever calls you make, I just use examples, right? For lineups, we use states and letters. This is where you as coaches can get creative, apply stuff that works for your system. At the end of the day, you need to know your personnel, you need to know your strengths, so keep calls simple, keep them consistent, but rely on the technical part of things. Rely on good form, good in executing that form. So know your, per yeah, know your personnel and know your strengths. And go Pat, go. Yeah. Thank you guys for your time, you've been awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys for your time.